and welcome to Women vs. Everything, a podcast for the modern era about the past era and women who overcame oppression to be the badass beings that they are. They made history that is not talked about enough and we are here to do that today. Uh, yes, so uh, that was Grace. I'm Jess. Um, and how this normally works is one of us picks a awesome badass woman from any period in history and researches her story while the other one researches the time and the context and things and then uh, we sew it all together on air and see what happens. But we're also starting to intersperse our regular episodes with interviews with awesome women who are doing interesting things in the world today. So today we we have a very special guest on the show. Uh, We have Dr. Eleanor Yanniger, who is a a medieval historian. And yeah, Eleanor, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about who you are and what you do? Uh, Yeah, sure. Hi, um, I'm Eleanor, and I am, just as you said, a medieval historian. I teach at the LSE, and I specialize most particularly in sexuality, apocalypticism, and propaganda in the medieval period, and in the later medieval period more generally. Um, So basically, I'm obsessed with sex and death. And uh, so I spent all my time kind of like rummaging around in uh, dead people's letters to prove that they are too. That's, I I love that. Very appropriate for the plague times. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) When I first started um, studying English literature years ago, um, I remember being told by one of my tutors, it's basically all sex and death. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much my field too. These are, these are great universals. I would have paid more attention in school. (laughs) Grace and I are not historians as we, as we tell our our (laughs) audience frequently. So I'm I'm sure that any actual historian would listen to some of our episodes and go, ooh that's not right or that's an oversimplification or something so yeah we uh, we wanted to get someone who knows far more than we do and i follow you on twitter obviously oh no <laughs> <laughs> no i love it i mean you do historical myth busting and cat pictures what's not to love that's true that's true there's a lot of that about you know <laughs> One of the things that I really kind of love that you do is you take these sort of beliefs that people generally have about the medieval period and you sort of bust them and say, that's not how it was. That's not quite true. Mm -hmm. So I guess as a starting point, I kind of looked up some common myths and misconceptions about that period. And really interestingly, the first thing that came up on this list as a myth is, quote, women were so oppressed in the Middle Ages that they never did anything of interest. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I thought that might be a good kind of jumping off point for medieval womanhood and, and, and things. I, <laughs> that reaction tells me you have thoughts on that. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this is something that I've, I've literally just finished writing a book about this, which will be out next year, so next September, kind of writing about um, medieval gender roles for women and expectations around them. And um, now I am not here to tell you that the Middle Ages is some kind of like a ungendered paradise where everyone lives in parody. That's absolutely, you know, not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also this really interesting thing that we tend to do now where we reflect our own ideas about, you know, gender and women all the way back on the past. And Mm. the thing about the modern era and in particular kind of the 20th century is we came up with this really new thing about women not working. And and we're like, oh, you know, women, they just stay in the house and that's all that women do. And, you know, of course, there's a side note to that, which is that was never true of all women. Of course, working class women were working the whole time, you know, the hints in the name, blah, blah, blah. But there was this expectation that, you know, women just looked after children and that's it. And that's super, super new, only really existed for like maybe a hundred years at a stretch. I could give you that. But we've reflected it back on the past. And it's interesting because for medieval people, yeah, like they definitely think of women as sort of mm, secondary, I suppose is the way to put it, because they've got, you know, religious and Christian beliefs that talk about, you know, women as responsible for, uh, of course, original sin. Literally in the Christian creation myth, Eve is made second after Adam, right? It's like Adam is the one. And then they're like, oh yeah, maybe something for Adam to, cause he's bored. Uh, so, you know, and then they make women. So it's like, you know, women are kind of thought of in that same way as an afterthought. There's also a lot of basing that off of Aristotelian or, you know, Platonic ideas about gender from the ancient period. Um, and the idea there is that women are kind of like an inside out man. Like, so a man is the first person, right? So that's like your basic human, you know, you press go and you get a white man. And then if you pull him inside out, then you could have the other kind of human, which is a woman, right? And so that's what medieval people are are working with. But 
as a result of that, you know, so women are not good, right? So men are all the good things. Women are all the bad things. Men are uh, considered to be, you know, really logical. They're very faithful. They're they're very devoted to God. You know, all of the good stuff. Um, maybe they have kind of a quick temper. Sure, that kind of goes with the humoral theory. That is the way that people think about bodies generally. So it's like men are hot and dry. Women are cold and wet. Uh, I want to stress here that medieval people think that, but ancient people also think it. And actually all people think about this up until about the 19th century. So don't worry about it. We don't get to be snobby about it. Uh, <laughs> so women then, of course, are defined in opposition to men. So women are inconstant. Women are garrulous. Women are massively horny. Women are uh, are just kind of a bit childish and stupid. Uh, and then the thing that they have that's good that's going for them is they're nurturing. Okay. So that's like the way to think about uh, personality types. So yeah, women are definitely kind of bad in uh, the medieval imagination about gender but the thing about it is they're also expected to be working and like doing stuff like being just because you're bad or whatever or you're not considered to be as good as men doesn't mean you like get out of doing stuff right <laughs> for them it's actually a reason why women are supposed to do more stuff than men do. So women are doing all kinds of really interesting things all the time. The great majority of medieval Europeans are peasants. So 70% of the population are peasants. Well, actually, no, 70% of the population, sorry, are serfs. 80% of the population are peasants. So that means you got 10% who are free. And peasants, pretty much, they all do all the same work, right? So it's like, if you own a farm, you don't get the luxury of being like, oh no, little lady, you're not going to help out because there's just too much work to be done, right? So women have to do everything that men can do. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that we find shake out that men do them a little bit more like um, plowing, especially when we, we're still only using ox collars because ox are a little bit difficult to control. So sometimes uh, men will do that more often. But if you look at the great majority of work that happens on the farm, if it's gendered, it usually shakes out that women are doing more work. Wow. They'll be tracts that are written by christians who are like don't get married uh, and like don't because it's basically don't have sex because god hates sex devote yourself to god sort of pamphlet mm. my irish catholicism is tingling here yeah very yeah. huge yeah. right you know they're like the ideal person obviously just doesn't have sex and devotes themselves to god so like maybe try that and one of the things <laughs> that they do when they're writing to women is they're like it sucks so much being married because of all the work you have to do. And there's this very famous track where they're like, imagine coming in from the fields and what is a woman to do when the cow needs milking, the baby is crying, mm -hmm. the cat is trying to get into the stew pot and your husband's complaining. Mm -hmm. It's not the second shift, right? Because now with the second shift, we pretend that that stuff isn't work. Medieval people are clear on its work, but they're like, and women do that. Right. So, so you could come and there's all this work to do. There's like animals everywhere. There's too much stuff to do. And your husband's just sitting there complaining instead of doing anything. Right. It's like, great. So this is the medieval women's law in life. On top of that, you know, there's all kind of cottage industries that medieval women are doing as peasants. Beer brewing, uh, massively gendered and yeah. kind of like a thing that women do. Weaving. Weaving's a woman's game. I don't mean to pick a fight with Flight of the Concords. This is a very old reference. <laughs> there was a Flight of the Concords joke about weaving being a man's game. But no. You know, things like that. So, um, you know, all of this industry is like specifically feminine and looked at in this particularized way. So that's one thing. If we're talking about sort of like the middle classes, we leave the countryside and go into the city. It's very interesting because, you know, this idea that women don't do anything, it's not really how it works. Actually, women are usually doing most jobs that men are doing at higher levels and within cities as well. But we lose a lot of records on them because of, you know, coverture. Right. So it's like if you marry a man, then if you're ever written about, it'll just be like Mrs. Dude. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of you being your name, it'll be like, yeah, yeah, well, Mrs. Dude did this. So most people who are, for example, if you're a guild person, you've probably married a woman who her family was in a guild. So she can do all exactly the same stuff that you can do. So like if you're a tanner, she can tan. You know, if you are a grocer, she probably understands all about like weighing spices, you know, all of these things. And within these contexts, women are usually expected to be the bookkeepers. So most women who are in this kind of middle class levels, they're really literate. They're really well educated. They know all about the job. But we just don't know that much about them because it's like, well, they come with the guy, right? So it's just it's just sort of hard to see them. They're occluded because we don't always have their names. But even having said that, we have tons of records of like women lending money to the court or like that lending money. That's a big one for women for some reason. Women owning shops. Um, there's a really great document that we have of there was a baggage train robbery in Switzerland in the 14th century. And uh, some guy like absolutely robs all this baggage train, steals all the stuff. And the majority of people whose stuff was stolen, it was all going to stores owned by women. 
So of the kind of like 50 some stores that didn't get their shipment because they were all stolen, the great majority of the store owners were women. And then, of course, at the very, very highest levels, if we're talking about like nobles or queens or princesses, they're all working the entire time. I mean, like, my God, yeah, you know, women, queens are sent on all sorts of different errands. They're doing high level diplomacy. Of course, you've got standout queens within this, right? So you've got like, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who's like, nah, I'm going on crusade myself. You're an idiot to my husband. So someone's got to look after this, you know, and there there are people who will who will be like that. But even without that, um, noble women are running their houses, which is essentially like running a staff of dozens. They have to understand how harvest works. They need to oversee all these different jobs. So women are working and doing terribly interesting stuff all the time. We literally just don't pay attention to them or yes. it's just difficult to pay attention to them because you can't see their names written down everywhere. And I mean, so we tend to know more obviously about queens than we do about everyone else because they're important. And so their names are written down and we miss out on ordinary people. Um, like we know a lot about nuns because nuns spend all their time writing. You know, it's like you tend to know a lot about people when they're writing stuff or stuff is written about them. So, I mean, it can also sort of seem like, oh, well, there's just nothing to know. But that's kind of true about medieval people generally, right? It's like we don't know as much about peasants because they're not literate and no one like really cares what they're doing. So anyway, that's stupid as hell. I'm very angry. That was a rant. <laughs> so <laughs> women be working, okay? Women be working. Damn. Like the, the, the entire conception of a woman in the medieval period is like someone who's just going to have to work really hard. Sorry. You know, like that's just how yeah. it is. And then, and then to call that not interesting, come on. What, you're so interesting? Why? Because you like to play Xbox? No, that's not interesting. I'm not interested in you. <laughs> How about that? Well, we are a pro rant podcast, um, <laughs> so that is that is good. Um, yeah, I mean, I've just been like scribbling notes on like things I was to ask you more about because there's just like so much there. And I think what you said about the work that women did, this homemaking work specifically, yeah. it's so interesting because those kind of ideas we still have those. It's still very much these mm -hmm. domestic tasks of, are still very much at a societal level, if not within individual relationships, put on to women. It's yeah. sort of defaulted as women's work. And I don't know, maybe in a way we've almost gone backwards on that because now a lot of people don't see it as work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. Um, when we consider these things now, it, we almost act as though it's a privilege. This is something that really gets my back up about like our ideas about gendered roles within the household now. It's like um, mm -hmm. there's so much emphasis placed on like women being mommies or a mama. And oh, isn't it great to be such a such a strong, proud mama at home raising your kids? And aren't you lucky? And you write a blog about it, take a picture, you know. And it's like, actually, this sucks, <laughs> you know. And like, and one of the reasons you know that, that stuff like, you know, child rearing is really hard and grinding other than if you literally ask ask anyone who's right god bless y'all don't know how you're doing it love you thanks thanks for <laughs> keeping the human race going but you know one of the reasons you know it's hard work is that the minute anyone gets money that's like the first thing we stop doing right like the first things we stop doing are like housework we're like can i get someone in here i do not want a vacuum i swear i will die if i have to mop the floor like i'm, I'm just gonna get someone else to do that or we get people in to look after our children. Like if we think about the extraordinarily wealthy, you know, people will be like, oh, Beyonce has the same number of hours in the day as you. And it's like, girl, Beyonce's got a staff. Okay. Yes. She, she does not have yeah. the same number of hours in the day. She's got like a nanny for every kid. Like, are you joking? Medieval people, exactly the same. So the minute they get money, they're like, oh, I am going to need someone to do laundry for me. I am not dragging this stuff down to the river. No, thank you especially rich women they will get wet nurses in like they have a baby and they're mm -hmm. like okay i'll see that baby in a year get that the hell out of my sight thank you not no interest in seeing this baby <laughs> you know like it'll be every, every single one of those things is conceptualized as really difficult as work that should be met with remuneration evil people have a lot stronger sense of the difficulty that surrounds doing kind of domestic work or child rearing. You know, they actually look at feeding children, that sort of things as labor. They're like, yeah, that's work. That, that right there, that's really hard work. Whereas now we're like, oh, it's a magical gift. It's the best thing that's ever going to happen to you. Aren't you lucky? Wow, so magical to breastfeed. And medieval people are like, no, it sucks. I hate it. You know, <laughs> like, And that's probably like um, actually healthier in a way because at least you're acknowledging what it is mm -hmm. that's going on there. Now we do this kind of subterfuge thing where we, we just, you know, say, oh, you're lucky. The work is its own reward. 
fantastic you get like you get nice mommy vibes and that's and that's what you get it's like i don't know man i think she looks pretty tired and like um no one did the vacuuming yeah that doesn't sound great to me you know (laughs) like i don't know (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's maybe one of the reasons that so many people who are in that role really struggle with it because there's there's this real sense put on them that they're supposed to be happy with it Mm -hmm. they're supposed to feel like it's this amazing thing and the difficulty is almost compounded by the idea of this isn't supposed to be difficult this is supposed to be easy and magical yeah we still have this idea that well women Women just do this stuff, right? Yeah. And Rousseau wrote about this uh, during the Enlightenment. And, you know, the Enlightenment guys, they've got a lot to answer for here. Um, And he said that, you know, in a kind of quote unquote natural state, women would just simply be able to raise babies just like that, uh, like animals do essentially like you know like a cat has kittens um it would just simply happen and you know you there you go you would like boom baby um but our society has created specific domestic roles for women and he frames this as a good thing and he's like well this is a part of like the march of civilization one of the things that is actually good is that um we've kind of separated women out from men in order to raise children because as a product of civilization is this kind of necessity to put more nurturing into children in order to prepare them for the world. So actually it's great that women are kind of like in the kitchen and not having a very nice time. That's good. It means that we've arrived as a species, but at the same time, there's this kind of like underlying, oh yeah, well, women could just do this, couldn't they? You know, they'll just be like a possum. Yeah. Just like put them in the pouch and like crawl around and like, and it'll be fine. And it's like, no, man, that's not actually how it works. But it's a real kind of like enlightenment, real modern way of looking at how the business of birthing and raising children goes. For medieval people, they're like, yeah, I don't know. Um, this happens because God hates you. Yeah, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> like, maybe that's a little more honest. I don't know. <laughs> it's very convenient for men, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's like, women should just do this because they're just, they're just naturally good at it. It's very convenient for men, that, isn't well, it? Well, guess who made those rules, you know? <laughs> And and that's the thing, like, um, my friends with kids now, you know, I've got a lot of, you know, I know some super involved dads, which I'm just like, that's correct. And one of the things I've learned to just be like, yes, correct. Because, you know, my girlfriends will be like, I swear to Christ, you know, every time he just changes a bit of a nappy, everyone is like, oh, wow, what an amazing dad. What a great guy. Ooh, gold star to you. Whereas they're like, are you serious? No one ever praises women for like changing a nappy, right? A guy does one thing and everyone is like, look at you. He's almost people. You know, it's, a, it's just crazy stuff, right? And so we still kind of perpetuate this idea where it's like, um, if a man does anything it's like wow look at that what a good boy you know whereas with women we're like i feel like you're doing that wrong the whole time and it's just yeah it's a nightmare it's a nightmare you know because you've spoken a lot about this like spiritual bypassing gaslighting like now you're so happy and you're meant to love it and Mm. at the very least it seems like there's also this like you're meant to be content you know you're meant to be completed As a woman, mm-hmm. you've leveled up, you've reached the next developmental stage. I think, you know, that's why there is still so much stigma around women that are like, this isn't enough. I want to go back to work. I want to be intellectually mm-hmm. challenged. I want to start projects. I want to start a business. I want, you know, I've had mm-hmm. my kid and it's not, it's not been enough. I think that's a really good point. And um, one thing that as a result of having a specialty in sexuality, you know, I, I work with mm-hmm. a lot of other sex writers and things like that. A thing that comes up a lot, I was talking to uh, Meg John Barker and Justin Hancock about about this is the idea that the new now the most important relationship that anyone will have in their life is this you know parental relationship and we've had mm-hmm. this new and sudden shift to being like oh well that's actually going to be the story of your life the story yeah. and the relationship of your life is going to be your relationship with your children and that's extraordinarily new because even if we were sort of looking at the you know 50s housewife ideal um still there their relationship was going to be your husband right and then you were also going to have children and that didn't quite work you know so we so we're like oh well maybe it's not uh, your spouse well maybe it's just uh, maybe it's your kids yeah yeah your kids that's going to be the thing that fulfills you you know and there's always this kind of emphasis on the idea that there's going to be like one relationship dynamic or one sort of uh, way of thinking about relationships that will finally fill you up inside, right? 
Um, and that's especially sold to women. Whereas it's like, well, probably you need a bunch of relationships and a lot of things going on in your life. <laughs> like yes. it's probably just like yeah. looking to any one relationship just to, to do everything. It's never going to work. So like, of course, people weren't fulfilled when they said that the only thing that was ever going to make them feel fulfilled was a marriage. Like, of course, that wasn't going to work. Never a medieval expectation. People were like, I don't know, man. Marriage is a business contract. So don't know why you're looking to that for familiar, for fami- <laughs> you know. And then like, then when that doesn't work out, we say, oh, it must be kids, right? And then we wonder why everyone's out here struggling. It's like, well, you need tons and tons of relationships to keep your mind engaged to to be happy yeah. to feel as though you're part of something you know this this kind of real atomized way of looking at relationships is very modern it's very neoliberal it's very like oh you can get everything that you need in your house and it's like you can't sorry no that's no. really interesting no. can i super backtrack and ask what might be a very basic question mm. what is a guild oh gosh that's a not that's a bad question at all sorry oh this is like bad medievalist i'm very yeah, nice. I, um, I don't quite understand <laughs> serfs either like you hear about the peasants and you hear about the nobility and the monarchy but i didn't know the other layers yeah so guilds are really interesting and i'm kind of obsessed with them and they are sort of like if you think about a combination between like a union and a okay. protection racket mm-hmm essentially. So basically they'll say that, okay, well, we're setting up a guild. And so in order to do X job, you have to be a member of the guild. And it's it usually happens within cities, right? Like no one's like going out to the countryside to see if like in a tiny village, this is how it's going. But um, it usually will be for the more big ticket item of things, but it, it could really be anything. So for example, in Paris, there's a guild of bathhouse owners so if you own a bathhouse all the other people in the guild have to say yes you can definitely have a a bathhouse and you can you can be in you know you have them for silk weavers you have them for people who make leather they'll be them for uh, making stained glass grocers who sell spices that's a big one uh fishmongers like basically any time there is money to be made a group of people will spread up and they'll say no we're guilt and the only way that you can get into the guilds is one you can be born into one. So if your dad is a member of a guild, like if you say your dad's a grocer, then you can be a grocer. Bing bong, done. Um, you can apprentice in. So generally this means that you work for a period of about seven years, your parents pay some money. And then at the end of it, you get your gold stamp. You're in the guild too. That's fantastic. Or you can just straight up buy your way in. You can be like, I have a ton of money. May I own a bathhouse? And then they'll go, yeah, yeah. Cause mm-hmm. you paid enough money in. You can also be invited, which is something that happens now. Uh, the guilds still exist. Like in London, they still exist, but they're mostly kind of like clubs now. Yeah, okay. But one of the things you might have noticed there is that the great majority of guilds are kind of like by men for men. Okay. So there are exceptions to this. So, for example, silk workers guilds, usually women. Um, oh. The bathhouse guild in Paris accepts women. So women can own a bathhouse, but they never get to be at the top of the guild. So they'll always be kind of like top members who make sure that everyone's doing the right thing. Women can't be at the top of the guild, but they can be in the guild. So this means that a lot of time women are expressly kept out of particular professions. But it also doesn't mean they're not doing it. So sometimes they'll also see there'll be rules, for example, with um, mercers who kind of like prepare stuff for cloth, right? And a lot of the time you're not supposed to be in the guild if you're a woman, but if your husband was a mercer and he dies, you can take his place within the guild. Oh, how interesting. So it can be like acknowledged, maybe you're running like one of these houses where you've got apprentices, you've got all this other stuff going on and your husband's dead now. Everyone can't just say, oh, well, I guess that house is out. It doesn't make sense. So you can kind of be brought in if you are a widow. And then you'll you'll be in the guild. And we do see that happen a lot with women. And it actually tells you exactly what you need to know, which is that women are doing the job. It's just that they're kept out specifically because they're women. And, you know, well, you know, women be shopping. You can't, like, you don't want them, you know, or like sinning or whatever else. You know, it's just yeah. kind of like a way of keeping things out. But we do kind of expect um, intermarriage between guild families and things like that. So, yeah, it, it, it's like a union, but not in an uplifting hooray for the workers way. More as in like a rich people won't let poor people do this way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. If I married a man who was a tailor, but I was doing mm-hmm. most of the work, he's just like, I suppose, a figurehead for the business. 
Yeah, so, like, he'll be doing tailoring, too. Like, the thing is, it's usually mm-hmm. kind of, like, side-by-side okay. sort of work. And he, and he's the one who will, like, go to meetings and stuff, yeah. right? So he goes out to the guild meeting. He'll be, like, the one that a lot of time conducts a lot of the business. And then he'll come down and tell you all about it. And you would say, yeah, okay, what? All right, I'm writing this down. How much money did you lend? What did you get? You know, and, and that is oftentimes, like, the person who is keeping the records is the woman. Uh, whereas the man kind of like doing more of the negotiations will be a man but that's not always the case and we don't always you know we don't always know we can't sort of like look inside every single relationship to see what's going on but especially you know the way to think about marriage in the medieval period is like that like it's mostly a business arrangement it's about kind of like getting the best business partner um yeah you're gonna have some kids with this person you're gonna like keep the business ticking over you're gonna keep the family ticking over but what people are attempting to do with marriage is kind of like get um the best sort of business aspects together in order to to keep things moving so it's a, a real different way to think about business itself and a real different way to think about marriage how interesting yeah yeah so okay that that's really interesting so it was almost this kind of separation of marriage from love Mm -hmm. whereas now i think we see them as very very intertwined in most situations Mm -hmm. and it's it's really interesting actually because for medieval people a lot of the time especially with higher up level people so you know nobles etc etc it was considered that love can be a part of marriage it's just not possible because if you're getting married for you know the purposes of you know diplomacy Mm -hmm. like of course you're not going to love that person you know right that's just what you have to do and the entire genre courtly love that uh is what the great majority of fiction kind of exists in the medieval period as it's entirely written around that right so the idea is that you've got uh kings and queens who are married and then uh you fall in love with like one of the hot knights like you know guinevere falls in love with lancelot even though she's (laughs) you know married to arthur and um that's where you get your romance from so like, like romantic love you know kind of passionate love as it was seen at the time is specifically an out of wedlock thing so it's like, yeah, you, you can go have an affair and that's where you'll get romance from. But what's going to happen in your marriage is you're going to do the right thing. You're going to have children. You're going to keep everything ticking over. And that's what marriage is for. If you want love, you're going to need to go and figure out how to fit that in along with every everything else. And this is less of a thing for people lower down the hierarchical structure like you know peasants well sure peasants do get married because someone's got a nice farm and it needs to go somewhere i'm not i'm not saying that doesn't happen but it isn't you know arranged marriage doesn't happen in exactly the same way so you do have a little bit more freedom actually if you're further down the social totem pole but still it's like you know yeah you might love your husband or wife that might be something that happens but that's like a, an optional extra that is like lucky mm. um most people would consider that that is not going to be the case so would it have been as like accepting for women to have love affairs as men um so this is an interesting one right because it's mm. like there's all this literature written about it and it's like oh yeah mm. this is like how you get your romance definitely gotta like go get some romance enjoy that but we also see that for example like in italy they'll be where there are laws against adultery which is not always the case some places have, have laws some places don't but um, I believe it's Florence that I'm remembering off the top of my head here. Um, they have fines for if you get caught. And the <laughs> fine for women getting caught doing adultery is higher than the fine for men. Mm-mm. And there's also this specific thing about like if a woman gets caught, that fine has to come out of her dowry. Mm. So oh, wow. it's like so her own personal money, she's got to pay for it. But... You know, the existence of a dowry there and they're being like, oh, that money will have to come out of your dowry kind of tells you who's getting prosecuted for this as well. Again, like it's not not that peasants don't have dowries, but it's like you're not going to like run your peasant wife into the court because, you know, she was cheating on you. But if you're a member of the nobility, you might like if there's some kind of like real face saving that you have to do. So women get in a little bit more trouble. But at the same time, you know, as I say, almost all fiction hinges on this idea that people are going to be having like relationships out of marriage. It's like you read, you know, the Canterbury Tales and it's absolutely Mm. nothing but wives 
like younger wives who are married to an older guy having sex with other young people. <laughs> like that's like, you know, the number one plot device going on in, in the yeah. Canterbury Tales, you know, all of, you know, it doesn't matter if it's like Tristan and Isolde, if it's any of the Camelot legends, if it's, um, you know, the Roman de la Rose, it's fair, 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 fair. And it's, it's kind of seen as almost inevitable in the way you're supposed to sort of fight it, but like you almost can't be too mad because, um, you know, well, in the first place, marriage isn't sexy. And in the second place, uh, women are so massively horny that you simply cannot stop them yes. from having a bunch of sex yeah. with people. So, like, what are you going to do? It would, it would, like, you know, be asking for, you know, the sun not to shine, right? <laughs> yeah, I was imagining that, that if it's a husband strays, it would be the one he had an affair with his fault. And if a wife has an affair, it's her fault. So yeah. I can hear how this narrative about women kind of being scapegoated and kept away from power, kept away from liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, that's such a really good point because it's like, it's really obvious, right? You know, the society is set up to keep women out of power and to say, well, you yeah, know, here's, here's the problem. Here's your problem with women. They're both temptresses and unable to overcome temptation. Yeah. You know, they're this, they're that. They're all the wrong things. But when we really look at how kind of medieval society is set up, if we look at gendered expectations, what we see is we've changed those almost completely, right? Yeah. Like, so, you know, yeah, okay, you're going to be a mom, but actually the main thing that you're going to be doing is working. All right, like, you are just too incredibly horny. Like, I guess you're just going to cheat on your husband all the time. All these things, right? And those are all the reasons given for why women can't have power in the medieval period, because they're just they're just wrong about it. But we think about women in a completely different way now. We're like, well, mom, are just you're just a natural mom. That's really what you want to do with your life. Oh, women hate sex and they just really want to be, you know, with a man. And the, the most important thing for them is going to be having this monogamous relationship. Oh, they don't want to work. They want to do this, you know. And that's why women can't be in power now. And that's why we keep them out of power. And it's like, hmm, it's really funny because if you look at it, it seems to me that the only thing that is the same over this whole arc of history, is that we keep women out of power. Exactly. We will change the math completely in order to get that same equation. You know, like, we'll just be like, yeah, yeah, it says here women are wrong. Yeah, well, wrong and bad. Yep. Yep. Nope. No power for you, little lady. We will just change anything. Anything. We're absolutely desperate to get to that same outcome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why the history of this is really important. Because, you know... um, people will make up their weird little trad wife fantasy histories about how like, you know, women were just like, I don't know, churning butter while milking a baby and loving life. Right. And it's like, well, that's not what it actually says on paper. So you need to actually go look at it so that you can get in an argument with these idiots. Not that they'll listen mind, but you know, you get to be right. And that's, and you can have that. <laughs> and that can be fun. It's nice yeah. to be right. <laughs> how did that transition happen? Like at what sort of point did it switch from, women be horny to actually women hate sex and just want monogamy and babies. Yeah. So that's a really interesting one. Um, and one that I've been working on a lot and it's like, it seems to change a bit. Um, again, the enlightenment is one of like these big kind of like periods where we start to see change. So the enlightenment is when we see this specific emphasis on women having to be uh, relegated specifically to the domestic realm in the first place. So the idea that like women are naturally quote unquote, not mm -hmm. disposed to being out in the world. So whereas, you know, with guilds and things like that, you'll see women, middle-class women who are really involved in business suddenly from the enlightenment on, it's like, no, 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 get in the back. Like you, you don't run the business. You don't run the store. You just run the babies. Right. So there, it's, it first kind of like comes from bourgeois women this set of expectations. What years was the Enlightenment period? The Enlightenment, it starts out in the 18th century. Okay. Um, okay. So, you know, your Voltaire, your Rousseau, all those guys, like, um, sitting around uh, making up stuff about... And, and everybody loves this now, too. This is the thing that really frustrates me. Like, when you're a medieval historian, everyone's like, oh, the Middle Ages, boo, bad, full of stupid <laughs> people who made stupid decisions. Not like the Enlightenment, which changed everything. And I'm all like, yeah. I will fist fight, I'll fist fight Voltaire in the street right now. <laughs> Actually. So, and I would win. And his, and he has terrible ideas about gender, you know, like terrible, terrible things are said, you know, actually in this period. And it's like, you know, get women out of the public sphere being one. Then in the kind of like 19th century, we start doing this, you know, reimagination of marriage. That's like when it kind of comes about when it's like, oh, no, marriage is for love. You love your husband, kiss him, kiss him sort of thing. <laughs> you know, like that, that really becomes um, 
a big emphasis. And you also have this whole, um, have you heard the phrase, the angel in the house? Yes. No. Yeah. So the angel, it's like this Victorian thing where it's like, oh, your wife, you put her on this pedestal. She's your little, she's your little domestic angel. And she's just like, oh, she just loves God and you and the babies. And she doesn't care about anything else. And you know what she definitely hates? Fucking. She absolutely (laughs) hates sex. (laughs) It's bad. Don't do it. And like, you see this kind of like real bifurcation into the whole kind of Madonna whore complex. Mm-hmm. Yes. at the time where it's like oh well, if you if you want to go have like nasty non-procreative sex then you should go and do that with a, a professional yes. rather than bothering your nice angelic housewife about it and it's around then that we start getting this kind of like idea of women being non-sexualized and so we we touched on that in our episode um about suffragettes Mm. Mm. as well so do you think one the suffragette was a movement in response to that or the other way around like people doubled down the angel of the house as a response to these women are getting ideas do you know yeah i think that that's i think it's a little bit oh it's hard that's a chicken of the egg one yeah. right because it's yeah, like obviously true. the suffragettes are like what the hell is this i am absolutely <laughs> not having it but then also people really dial it up in response to that you know in the yeah. same way that you know like how you see again you see like the trad wife thing now where it's like oh yeah. I'm, I'm not like other girls i love being boring you know like okay like the, you know the whole yeah. sort of pick me response right <laughs> mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. and I think that like for Victorians and like that, that sort of period, there's a real dialing up of all these things, you know. Um, But I also think that within this period, you start to see people like, you know, Freud or, you know, the Jungians and people who start looking at sex in a kind of particular psychological way. And there's almost this thing, I think, about uh, paying attention to sex and saying, okay, well, this is a thing that that exists, like, not just as like a sinful thing that, you know, we're trying to kind of curtail. But we start going, oh, well, sex is this, um, it's kind of like an organizing principle. It's something that everybody does. And we start to kind of like it. Mm Mm-hmm. As a result, we kind of go, oh, well, the sex is sort of good, maybe. You know, people seem to like it. It seems really driving. And then the minute we think sex is good, we're like, oh, women don't like that. (laughs) No. It's like when sex was bad, right? When sex was just, like, bad and sinful. And you had to spend, like, your whole time, you know, like, for medieval people, they're just like, please, I'm just begging you, please just have penis and vagina sex and get pregnant. Like, will you just please stop jacking each other off? And medieval people are like, I will never stop jacking other people off. (laughs) That's all I want to do is just like, is hand stuff. That's what's fun for me. And the church is like, just put that, put that down. Please have missionary sex. And no, you know, and like, and that is when women are really interested in sex, right? Women Mm -hmm. are really interested in sex when it's like sinful. You shouldn't be doing it. It's only for having kids, blah, blah, blah. Now... It's interesting because we've almost internalized like the church's line on sex, right? Which is that like, oh, well, really, really, sex is only for having kids. The only reason we we have sex is, for, you know, for procreation. It's like, uh-huh, sure. That's why, uh, like, every time everyone has sex, they get pregnant, is it? No, <laughs> right? Uh, but we've internalized what the church, like, the, the medieval church would be jumping for joy about the way we talk about sex now where they're like, they think it's only penis and vagina. The thing there is that we're like, oh, well, it's natural right Mm. it's natural and like the sex is only for having babies and so it's therefore good because that's what it's for and if sex is good then women don't enjoy it and it's like well you know and here i'm talking about cis women as well um but it's like well you know if if the only type of sex quote unquote that is real which is the way that we talk about it now you know we have like the the stupid baseball analogy that americans use for sex where it's like Mm. you know a home run is Mm -hmm. like penis and vagina sex Um, If that is what we count as real sex and everything else doesn't count, well, yeah, you know, people with clitorises are going to be a lot less interested in in that, Yeah, perhaps. If if you're saying that's the only thing on the menu, they'll be like, I don't know, man, I could take it or leave it, right? Whereas Mm -hmm. for medieval people, sodomy, which is like all the sex that can't get you pregnant, right? That's what sodomy means. It's in sodomy, not just bud stuff. Uh, sodomy is everything that can't get you pregnant um when that was like the church was like please we got to stop everyone doing this they keep doing this instead of having babies then women were really into sex right and now we're like no that doesn't count that's like foreplay that's just making out that's not sex and so suddenly women don't like sex and women really want monogamy and women really want like all basically the minute we change the organizing principle of sex what is sex what is it for what does it do when mm-hmm. we think of it as good and we think of it as only being penis and vagina, then suddenly women don't like it, right? 
because women are always wrong. Women are always just wrong, isn't it? It's like it get, they're on the wrong side of things. So, you know, I think a lot of it has to to do with the kind of like reconfiguration in the 19th and 20th centuries about what sex is and how to think about it. Like, you know, you got Freud out here with his uh, immature orgasm to talk about clitoral stimulation, for example. Oh, that makes um, and me to so be mad. fair. Oh, yeah. Have you heard this one? This is great. So he's like, um, women who uh, try to orgasm through clitoral stimulation, he calls that an immature orgasm, whereas a mature orgasm is uh, one that is achieved vaginally. I hate him so much. Oh, Freud. Just because you can't find the clit, honey. <laughs> yeah, I know, and it's like, the, the thing of it is, it, it, does, it plays into this thing, right? This, this, this one conception of sex, which is that uh, mm. sex is for procreation. So it's like... Um, like anything that is doing something that is non-procreative is somehow off or wrong. It's like, oh, you yes. messed your sex up there because you were supposed to be trying to to procreate, right? You know, and it, it's that whole thing about like, you know, masturbation is just practice for real sex. You know, like the only real sex can be one where someone might get pregnant, blah, blah, blah. Which is giving so much power to the cock and the cock owner. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's near, it's I literally have the key. yes to the real thing that you've just been practicing for. And mm -hmm. if my key isn't around or is a bit, you know, stressed or sleepy today, then nothing is happening. Nothing's got, nothing's you know? happening, right? Nothing that counts, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting too because we've still really internalized that um, when we're talking about heterosexual relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it's like just ignoring that all of our queer friends exist, right? It's like, okay, well... Um, but, but at the same time, we still do this real privilege of kind of like sex that involves penises because like no yes. one would say, for example, to men who have like penetrative sex of some yes. description, no one would say they didn't have sex, right? Correct. Everyone would be like, oh yeah, right. That, that looks like some sex to me. Yep. But if like, if it's to women, yeah. if the sex isn't penetrative, it's like, they don't know. Well, is that really sex? Mm. Yeah. And yeah. And gay men don't get asked then who's the man, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, ideally. Because it's like, well, one of you has the key. <laughs> yeah, and it's But the like... other ones, you don't have a key, so does it exist? <laughs> you know? And it's interesting because you, you do sort of see this also in medieval conceptions of sex, right? So uh, when, mm -hmm. like, there's, okay. there's a physician who is writing about um, when young women masturbate. And there's this kind of thing, like, about, like, oh, well, what do you do about young women masturbating? Because, you know, the puberty hits and they get so horny, they, they want to do something, right? And he writes about it. They never really tend to mention that the clitoris exists, but they'll talk about, like, rubbing the vulva, right? Uh, and they'll be like, so they'll rub their vulva and they'll imagine in their heads a penis. <laughs> 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 which just like oh, cracks wow. me up because it's like they've got like they've got the actual mechanism and they're like and they'll just they're just sitting there furiously thinking about dicks right and like that and that's how you <laughs> masturbate and it's like okay all right buddy like i think i mean maybe like i can't say no but it's it's just like you know the the way that the imagination and the erotic imagination works around all these things is that well women must be thinking about penises all the time mm. obviously you know if one is absent then there's this like great lack there and um you know to be fair we also have like plenty of evidence from the medieval period that like women were going around you know women had dildos there were strap-ons women were having sex with women using strap-ons you know we know this uh so i'm not saying that these aren't things that people were interested in or they can never be interested in it i'm just saying that the privilege that we place on that within you know sexuality more generally is um outsized We'll put it that way, yeah? <laughs> right. I think placing any kind of universal on anything to do with sex is very dangerous because it's mm -hmm. just so endlessly nuanced and complicated that it's, it's just impossible to say everyone of this gender feels this way. Yeah, it's like, mm. I mean, you wouldn't say that about food, yeah. right? Yeah. You wouldn't go, yeah, everybody just absolutely loves a spicy curry, you know? Like, you wouldn't yeah. say something like that. But for some reason, when it comes to sex, it's like, this is what people, you like this. It's like, come on, man. Know right, like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of range of actions out there, right? Yeah, that's so funny because I like I compare 
my pansexuality to liking food you know mm. and it's just like sometimes you want a spicy curry and sometimes you want a salad and sometimes you know you're really attracted to this and and it's okay and it's okay to be fluid and really if anything there's so many things should be non-hierarchical but if it's, mm-hmm. if it's anything it should be sexual acts because it's mm. yes <laughs> oh preach i love this yeah right like, how <laughs> How? Or, you know, say, or say even it's something that you love. Uh, Okay, so say for me, um, someone is like, have some sushi. I'll be like, fuck yes, sushi, right? Now, if the 10th day in a row you're like, sushi, I might be like... I'd like a pizza, you know, like it's just, you know, if if it's just going to be exactly the same thing day in and day out, I'm not going to be able to handle it, right? So it's, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that we tend to treat sex as though there is this one sexual script, right? Mm -hmm. And that, like, it's always the thing. Everything always plays out in exactly the same way. And, um, you know, I I do believe that, like, uh, the medieval church played the long game here. They really got us in the end. Uh, but And it's hilarious because all these people who think they're looking at things, quote unquote, scientifically now are just upholding this one particularized line. It's ridiculous, yeah. you know. Or just don't even question it. Because it's a bit like you said about like, you know, the woman gets birth and becomes this mother. It's it's just what you do. It's, it's kind of mm-hmm. like you turn off the lights, the room gets darker. So sex equals this. It's just never questioned. Yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah. you're that's what the eventual aim is and what you're always, always trying to do. And, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And also it's just stupid, like, you know, clearly, clearly the great majority of times that people have sex has absolutely nothing to do with procreation there. Are, and, you know, it's one of these uh, really difficult, you know, again, sp- spot the person who spends too much time with sex educators. Uh, like, uh, you know, we spend all this time saying, well, this is what sex is for. And then when people do want to become pregnant, they oftentimes find that it's actually really hard. And like, you know, yeah, I will know lots of people, you know, who got pregnant. It took them ages of trying when they were like, well, fuck, you know, because in, I don't know, I went to Catholic school. So they're basically like a guy looks at you the wrong way. You're pregnant, you know, and then Absolutely. like you actually decide yeah. you want to be pregnant. And it's like, oh, this is really hard. Actually. Right. They make it sound like it's going to just be the easiest thing in the world that it could happen, you know, so easily by accident. And then suddenly uh-huh. you're trying. And it's like, oh, actually, this is harder than I thought. Yeah. 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 Wear so five and condoms, he, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like and condoms are, yeah. And they'll be like, oh, well, they're only 93% effective. And it's like, well, they, that's 93% effectivity over a year of use. Like, mm-hmm. and also even without birth control of any kind i think it's like the sort of like 10 percent of sex can you know lead to pregnancy something mm-hmm. like that it's, it's, it's super low it's super low actually um but we are really against telling uh, young people that yeah mm. because they're worried because we're worried that if we give them the actual facts then they will go and yeah and in a way it's like that that's the worst thing that can happen to you mm-hmm. versus you know catching hepatitis or you know something like that but we're also meant to crave motherhood. <laughs> you know, so it's the best. Yeah, it's like, thing. you know, the worst thing that would happen is that you've got the, you know, motherhood is definitely the thing you want to happen. But the worst thing that can happen is if motherhood comes at the wrong time, uh, you got to do yes. motherhood exactly at like, on. you've got to set the timer and go. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, dude. I'm, it, it, it seems like a lot to me. That's all. <laughs> For sure. Just touching in on, I suppose, how much this, like we're talking about, about the penis, penetrative sex with a penis mm-hmm. being the default, how much that relates to rape culture. And mm-hmm. creep, I hate the term creeping consent, but I, you know, I don't know what else leads to it, you know, because you've agreed to hand stuff. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. that means that's a gateway to yep. other stuff. And I also just want to say, like, how much people with cocks also lose under this system mm-hmm. you know? yeah 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 it, it's an interesting one because a lot of times uh people who have penises you know they don't necessarily report that their favorite thing to happen is like you know penis and vagina sex but you know they're told that that's the one kind they're allowed to have so yeah. you know and everything else is you know emasculating or you know mm-hmm. not real and it's like you know you yeah. should you should be having sex in this way otherwise you know it's a failure to not get mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. yeah absolutely you were talking about obviously lots of things about sort of pregnancy and sex with procreation and things so this is this is something i wanted to ask you about that i know you've written about medieval contraception tell us yeah. about that so you know the quote-unquote rhythm method 
is not ineffective. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, you know, as we were just saying, even perfectly done, you know, sex, even if someone is like, even if you have a penis ejaculating directly up into a fornix, just work up, up in there, you know, uh, <laughs> it, you, you still got to get the timing on that really right. You know, the days, all these things, it's still not necessarily going to happen for you. So, you know, there is still this kind of holdover from that. Um, if you also already have children or something and you're like breastfeeding, that's going to lower your chances of getting pregnant, stuff like that. So there, there's all this kind of like within there. And we do think that people are probably doing some pulling and praying because the church is always like, stop that. <laughs> like, absolutely. <laughs> c- cut it out. You know, like, no, even if you're having penis and vagina sex, if you pull out before ejaculation, uh, that's sodomy. You've just done sodomy. So, you know. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Because hey. she can't get pregnant then. Right. So the bang, what the fuck? sodomy. So there you go, right? Yeah. Like we could all do going back to old conceptions of sodomy because, you know, if we acknowledge that that's all the fun stuff, <laughs> then, <laughs> then, you know, we, we would be better off, right? So that's all, that's all kind of like in the milieu. The great majority of stuff you will sometimes find like in medical recipe books, stuff like that, um, things that are supposed to stop uh, contraception. But if you look at them, if when they are effective, a lot of the time they're technically not like contraceptives and they're more like abortifacients. Yes. So uh, they are pretty up on like pennyroyal use, for example. They're like, yeah, that'll that'll stop some some baby, uh, which it will. So pennyroyal will uh, cause abortion. What, what is um, pennyroyal? Pennyroyal is a herb, and it basically you can uh, distill it down into an oil. You can make tea out of it, and if you uh, ingest enough of it, it will basically it will make the uterus hemorrhage. So it's a, a wow. fairly effective abortifacient. So like that's when they're when they're like, yeah, here you go, here's a contraceptive. A lot of time it's actually even abortifacient and you know what have you. But um, having said that, they've also got a slightly different relationship to abortion than we do, mm. um, which is that it was a bit more chill. And they were kind of like, oh yeah, first three months, that's like a gray zone. That's sort of like you know, it's nobody's favorite. They're not like, oh yeah, that's like, go for your life. It's definitely not sinful. They're like, eh, it's, you know, it's looking kind of sinful. You know, it's not great. You know, 10 Hail Marys, uh, you know, a bit of fasting on feast days for a year. There you go. Like, mm. sort of. Wow. But part of the reason why they were like, yeah, we'll let you off pretty lightly with abortion is that um, we do see that, you know, in a world without contraception and, you know, also that places this huge premium and emphasis on religious things, we see a lot of infanticide, uh, oh mm-hmm. which is really sad, you know. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of, like, babies who get born and are immediately killed. And seeing this and acknowledging kind of, like, the reality of the situation, the church is like, well, I'm team don't kill an actual baby, right? You know, it's like, there'll be all this, like, hand-wringing about how fetuses are children, but it's like, you know, ask someone, it's like, there's a baby in a room that's on fire and, like, a a, a fertilized egg in a dish, and you can only save one. Right. At that point, everyone knows the difference. Yeah. You you know the fucking difference. Like, don't yeah. don't start with me. That That's what the church comes down on the side of. They're like, well, if this is, if this is going to be, like, the two endpoints if it's like an abortion or you know a, a baby's going to be drowned or something down at the other end then please have an ab- we'd rather see you do the abortion and we do know that abortion is fairly available right so one, one thing uh that's interesting to note uh, when we talk about the history of women there's kind of like uh th- there's a historical myth that is like when um midwives are persecuted in the witch trials in the early modern period that it's because midwives are basically women get eventually not allowed to go to school to be doctors like you know they were never really allowed in universities there's some exceptions Mm -hmm. Uh, but towards the end of the medieval period to be um, you need to go to university to be a physician women can't go to university so therefore women can't be physicians blah 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 and people say, oh, well, this is part of the reason why midwives are persecuted as wishes is because they don't have their certificate. So, but that's not really the case. When we see that midwives are killed as witches, which is something that definitely happens, to be fair, uh, it's usually because they're doing abortions. Mm. Oh, wow. So we do see a lot um, in the witch per- persecutions of the early modern period. You do see midwives crop up a lot. If you look into it, they're usually doing abortions. And that is like one of these telltale like witch signs, right? Mm-hmm. Is that um, there's two things that like 
witch hunters, a Heinrich von Kramer who wrote the Maleficatorum or a Hammer of Witches. He's like, oh yeah, midwives are witches all the time. And they're either, if they're not swapping out a baby with a demon, they're doing abortions, right? And this is, you know, and you gotta look out for them. Right, and it's it's this specific thing that is linked to abortions, and it's in the early modern period where the idea that abortions are definitely beyond the pale mm-hmm. and something that you shouldn't be doing, that ramps up. Uh, in the medieval period, it is certainly a sin, but it's accepted more just because they would just rather not see babies get killed. So, you know, that's kind of like your range of things. Interestingly... Yeah, for uh, medieval people, a lot of birth control is a lot more like abortion. It's a lot more like sometimes a fantasy because basically what they've got that is available to them is mm. penny royal or, you know, just killing babies, which is not ideal. So, you know, wow. I, I love to live in the 21st century. You know? Yeah, so nice to have so many options. Woo-woo! Weren't, weren't female brewers also accused of being witches? then again yeah that you do tend to see that as well and it's like uh that's an interesting one because we're not exactly sure if that is just because like someone didn't like that lady or mm. like you know does she have too much money it's like you know a lot of which uh accusations when they do come up it does seem like someone just doesn't like someone jealousy you know? yeah. yeah yeah there's a lot mm. of that you know and uh you know when the when the panics really get going you know like we lose like almost entire towns in sweden like men and mm. women. It's just like, no, hang them all. Um, so other which point, hanging, not burning. They hung them. So oh, so one yeah. of my, like a lot of my research or topics or ideas for episodes comes off uh, Facebook memes, which I'm sure <laughs> yes. are super accurate about history. And mm-hmm. I did see one that said that the female brewers had the, they had large pointy hats so that when they're in a crowd in a pub, people could see them and call for another drink and that's where the witches with pointy hats thing came from was it it was all of a sudden not okay for women to have this profitable enterprise Mm, yeah Um, so they were accused of being witches yeah i've heard this one before i don't know that the pointy hat thing actually existed the witch thing though that i will say i you know i buy um the kind of thing that the witch panics and the witch trials do coincide with the kind of beginning of forcing women out of public life and yeah. forcing women out of uh, public enterprise in the same way. The enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Exactly. How ironic. <laughs> exactly. So um, you, you begin to see much more emphasis on women doing stuff wrong in, in this way that you, you just don't see stuff like this in the medieval period. Like uh, yeah. you'll see, you, you see brewing women get in trouble, but brewing women get in trouble all the time for brewing bad beer. That'll be like a thing. Like one of the big places, you know, that we see women pop up in the historical record is like someone made a really terrible trash batch of ale and then she gets in trouble and so uh, she gets put in the, the well, it's called the cucking stool at the time. So this is this, I'm bringing up the cucking stool uh, slash ducking stool as a good kind of way of thinking about this, right? So the cucking stool starts out as a chair and you will put it in front of your house. You'll sit in that chair and everyone will be like, hey, Sarah, your ale sucked. Boo, boo. And like everyone just comes and boos you, right? And it's just like in the really tight knit communities of the medieval period public shame is like that's one of their big punishments right Mm. and that is like oh you don't want that you don't want to be publicly shamed later on as like the early modern period progresses suddenly like the stool gets put on like a big pillar sort of thing and they can move it up and down they'll push the chair like on wheels through the town and you're up really high and then everyone is like boo sarah bad beer boo that sucked boo 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 you know and then they'll come like yell and it's much more of a spectacle by the early modern period they will then take that chair down to a lake you know oh and then they God. dunk and then they dunk you in a lake oh gosh and interestingly this is not really we tend to associate ducking stools in that and like the whole it's essentially Witch waterboarding trials. Yeah, yeah, it's not, and it's not really a witch trial usually. Yeah, the number one reason why women get put in the uh, in the ducking stool um, is like a gossip 
or being a scold. Wow. Poor Sarah kept brewing Bud Light anyway. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, <laughs> you know, and it'll also be one of those things where if you keep making bad beer, they'll like up the punishment where they're like, we told you That's to fucking so stop. Funny. Right? Oh my God. And, and so like, they'll ramp it up in that way. And then, so by the time that ducking stools are really used a lot, kind of like in the 18th century and around the shop, it's usually for women who are just annoying people. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's literally just like they'll waterboard you for a while until you say you're sorry and promise not to be such a scold essentially. And we, it's interesting because we associate them with witch trials now and that's not really what they were for at all. They were, but they were definitely used for enforcing gender norms, Mm -hmm. which is that like women shouldn't be annoying people. We do see the same thing like with witch trials in the early modern period when you see like the retreat of women into the household and, you know, they're being sort of uh, kept out of public life. Uh, But I always try to emphasize that that is that's a modern phenomenon. And, you know, witch trials are a modern phenomenon and seeing women in that way for medieval people, women are kind of an integral part of public life. So even down to the fact that when they mess up, when they are brewing, it's sort of like, well, yeah, it's a community concern but it's policed by the community in a very public way. I want to ask you about the history of gossiping and punishment for gossiping as well. Yeah. You know, about women coming together, being like, watch out for this man. Never be alone in a room with him. Mm -hmm. Are forms that, it's a form of gossip that women have used to keep each other safe for centuries. And I can Mm -hmm. understand why men would not want women congregating to exchange that information. Yeah, and this is this is one that drives me crazy. Um, yeah. So uh, the gossip a lot of the time, fun term from the medieval period. It'll be called the sins of the tongue, which is a nice one. Mm. And gossip is seen. I think I was in that movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, gossip is seen a lot of the time um, as super injurious in the medieval period because there's a real conception, you know, as I was saying, you know, of public shaming being this serious way of policing crime. It's because people are. are considered to sort of own their reputation, almost like an object. So uh, your reputation or your fama is sort of like the way that, you know, business deals are done, how you see yourself in a community, the way that you are able to be trusted to do business deals with. And so gossip can be seen as taking then away from your fama. And if you damage someone's reputation, that has real knock-on effects for absolutely tons of other things. We do tend to see that in cases where people get in trouble for gossip, a lot of the time it'll be like men talking shit about men. (laughs) Like, that's a big one. They'll be all like, homie, you can't do that. No, 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 no. (laughs) No. Uh, But it's also seen, like, people talk constantly about how women gossip all the time. Mm. Um, And it's something that you'll see, like, priests complaining about in uh, sermons and things like that. You'll see people talk about it also, uh, especially in places where women congregate. So washing um, is like one of these big places. So washing uh, clothing and laundry is terribly laborious process uh, before we had washing machines. It takes like days. Basically, you've got to like put your clothes with ashes in some water, let them sink. Then you got to take them down to some running water. Then you got to like soap them up. Then you've got to rinse them. Then you've got to wring them. Then you've got to dry them out. And it's all really heavy. It's all really dangerous work. So women tend to get together and do it with each other. They'll be sort of like appointed places at a spring. There'll be like uh, specific washing houses that are built and everyone kind of helps each other with everything. As you know, they're there and they're hanging out. And so they gossip, right? Because like, what else you got to do? And oh my God, men will not shut up about this. And like, they, they write about this all the time and they call them the quote unquote women's courts. Uh, where they're all like, oh yeah, and men are afraid to go to where all the women are washing because like the women are like, yeah, that guy, he's, he's a piece of trash, you know? And then they, <laughs> they all tell each other. And, but it's really funny because it's really clear that they also feel like they can't stop that. Like mm-hmm. they complain about it. They don't like it. But there, you know, you see like the, the women's courts says exactly what you were saying, Right. Because it's like, oh, this is where women go through all the stuff that has happened and they come to their own decisions about people. So it's like, you know, squeaky step stuff where it's like, you know, stay away from that guy. Here's this. What do we think about this? And all the women will kind of get together. So people are kind of desperate to stop this, you know, which is why, you know, your priest will ask you if you're gossiping. The priest will give a big sermon about how bad gossiping is and how you shouldn't do that. People are always talking about how women talk too much, blah, blah, blah. But we see a little bit less of women actually getting in trouble for damaging fama 
in these spaces because also at the same time it's always like well women what are you gonna do and now that's not to say it doesn't happen we certainly have lots of records of you know women getting in trouble but a lot of the time it's men because it's got to be like someone who's worth suing right um or a lot of the time it'll be like women taking each other to court and they'll be like oh they throw the best insults like you know it'll be like two women were brawling in the street and one called the other one like a said she cuckled a fish and all this stuff and you're like girl what you know like that'll be you know <laughs> really intense stuff they're kind of in trouble for damaging reputation but really what they're in trouble for is like fighting in the street right yeah and okay. you'll get the gossip okay. thing thrown in on top so it'll tend to be a little bit more gendered overall but you know yeah the people who get in trouble for gossiping writ large are women but it's like a little bit more like slap on a wrist when it's women where it's like, hey, girl, I said, again, back to the cucking stool with you. You stand in front of everyone where they're like, hey, Sarah was saying that Maud cucked a fish. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck, Sarah. You know, like, and they're like, Sarah, I swear, you know, and like, that'll be like the whole thing. Whereas with men, a lot of time money will exchange hands. Mm. And, and okay, like interesting. So, yeah. All of this is just so fascinating. I've learned so much. This is brilliant. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. You know, it's like all the stuff that I'm obsessed with. I'm like, this is interesting, right? <laughs> it, it definitely is. It definitely is. I'm a bit puzzled because I said I've I've definitely been to things in museums and quite what I would consider the more reliable means like mm -hmm. like historical stuff. Yeah, and they'll have you know this awful device and it's like a cage for your head and the yes. piece for the tongue. Scolds masks. Yes, this is to stop women from gossiping. Mm. And like, you know, and there is this echo still today. Women talk too much. Women are bitchy. Women are, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. women make spaces unsafe for men now, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet it was mostly men that were recorded as being in trouble for it. It's, it's... Well, it's like, you know, when women get in trouble and, you know, as I say, women get in trouble a lot of the time. It's like women get in trouble for talking shit about women. Or it'll be like sometimes, you know, with ducking stools or stuff like uh, scolds masks when they come in. A lot of time it'll be a, like people are like scolding their husbands in public and other people don't like it. Mm, okay. To be clear, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. But it's like the scold stuff a lot of the time, that's even slightly different to gossiping. So there's a difference between like gossip, which is just being like, yeah, you know, fuck that guy or whatever, right? That, that's one thing, right? So that's like your, your low level gossip. Scolding. That's on top of that. Okay. Right. So scolding is kind of like, you know, it's akin to, it is one of the sins of the tongue, scolding. But it'll be that like you're in public yelling at people. Mm. And that's not the same thing as gossip, right? It's like gossip can be idle. Gossip can just be like something that everybody's like doing while they have a couple of beers. You know, okay. that's that. But scolding, that's one up. And you will, women get in trouble for scolding all the time and men don't get in trouble for scolding. Okay. There's a difference, right? So scolding is like disturbing the peace. Mm -hmm. So like scolding. Yeah. So if you go up to a guy, so it's like one thing for you to be washing clothes and be like, yeah, I heard that, you know, John groped Amy against his will. Uh, fucking John, you know, like that's, that's one thing, right? You, you can get away with that. Going up to mm. John and being like, hey, John, I hear that you groped Amy. What the hell is wrong with you? You be like, then that's, mm. and it's not gossip there necessarily. That's the problem. It's the scolding wow right That's you see really the difference yeah so it's like and it mm. does the same thing it's a damaging pharma but also kind of what you're getting in trouble there is for disturbing the peace you know you're making it oh you made it awkward now it's awkward right like you're getting in trouble for making it awkward more than you're necessarily getting in trouble for uh violating someone's reputation mm. yes because we still get this inherent shame about like mm -hmm. excluding abusers from communities or confronting abusers directly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it's really a problem, especially in certain communities uh, where it'll be like, can't exclude the abuser. And it's like, we can't? Fuck, I thought we were the ones that, you know, had a set of guiding rules or whatever. But I do think that there's this sort of, oh yeah, so her name is Captain Awkward. She does a very good blog. And she wrote this amazing thing years ago now called Geek Social Fallacies. Oh yeah, she's brilliant. Where it's like, um, there tends to be a thing where people, especially mm -hmm. if they uh, were, you know, nerdier growing up, have more difficult time sort of like excluding people or policing people. Well, actually, I don't want to say the term policing because boo police. Uh, but they like, you know, they'll be like, oh, even if nobody likes this person, even if this person has done something really wrong, we can't exclude this person. Right. It's almost like excluding someone is 
always worse than the thing the person has done that warrants it, even if what they've done is something really egregious, like assaulted someone yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. And this will be, and you'll see this very, very commonly. So for example, you know, you'll see people kind of like make statements about like, oh, well, these people stopped talking to me just because like, whatever. And like, and that's abusive. And it's like, no, it isn't, dude. Like if you were being really horrible to people, no one owes you their company, right? Yeah. It's super, super common for people to act as though Correct. that's what the problem is. It speaks to the sort of like medieval, I, these medieval ideals. It's like, well, the number one most important thing is the harmony of the community. The number one most important thing is like making sure the village continues to muddle along, right? And so now in these new imagined communities, these newly created communities that we make in all these various places, we still do the same thing where it's like, oh, the problem there is, well, don't be mean to that person. Da, 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 where, where actually, no, be mean to that person. <laughs> <laughs> right? Stop over identifying. I know. And it's like, I mean, and I'm not even act, like saying scold them or whatever, but it's like, oh, excluding them? Mwah. Love to exclude people who have done something terrible, actually. I love a little bit of that. That's great. Yep. Yeah. Actually in favor of yeah. that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. In the medieval period, what they have said was scolding is kind of a little bit similar to what some people might call cancel culture. Oh, yes. Today. Yes, exactly. That is that. Like I can see some parallels. Yeah, yeah, right. Where it's all like, well, hey, oh, you know, you're the one who made it. Like, it's weird now because you're talking about it. And Oh, think about yeah. that guy. And it's like, what do you mean? Think about that guy. Like he's over there. Yeah. Right. Like he's still he's still doing his job or whatever, you know, but it's the disruption. It's this disruption mm -hmm. from a norm. You're the one by bringing it up that made something awkward where it's like they would people prefer the awkwardness of like, you know, yeah, like, sure, sure. Go gossip in the bathhouse. And like whisper network, fine, keep that up. That's fine. That's like gendered in this right way. And you can go ahead and keep that up. The minute it leaves those circles, it leaves this kind of like the gendered confines. And it becomes something that maybe everyone will see, maybe everybody will be aware of. Then that's when we've got a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is never the problem. The problem is bringing the problem to light. Right. Yeah. I imagine that might have been needed as well in like small oh, yeah. villages and stuff where it's like, well, the, the village has to come together to harvest or else we have mm -hmm. no food for the winter. So if everyone's engaged in a dialogue and, and this guy storms off and leaves the village and he's the only person who can supply us meat or something, that was based on survival. Yeah, we're still carrying the echo of that trauma, but it's not appropriate to how our Yeah, yeah. I mean, are. we used to be in much smaller communities. We used to be like really um, knitted in yeah. with the people who are around us and now we live in absolutely huge communities mm. a lot of the time even even what is a small low town now that's a pretty good sized village in the medieval period right mm. um so if you consider that like medieval london had like what ten thousand people and everyone was like oh that's a lot of people you know like that's it tells you like what you need to know so we are lucky in certain ways because we we do have the ability to kind of like pick and choose we don't actually have to necessarily keep people around and i'm not saying write people off right away but i am saying that you know if someone is consistently doing things that are harmful you know there's a lot of other people out there you'll be fun you know maybe they could do some introspection and go get some new people and it's not your problem anymore right that's all yeah oh my god okay i could talk to you for hours this is all so <laughs> fascinating and, and so good and i love it so much so grace do you have any more like burning questions or shall we go into the lightning round in a minute yeah, it's just, I feel the same. I'm just like, I can't ask any more big questions because I have so much to like sort out in my head and reflect on from this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, it's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, a yeah, pleasure. And it's, so, a pleasure. it's so interesting how you kind of bust all these misconceptions. Mm. Thing is about the misconceptions, I mean, just one thing I, I guess supposed to say to cap it off is we have misconceptions like this and ideas like this because, um, you know, we don't really get taught about the medieval mm. period. It doesn't really come into generalized education. It is not the thing that we are taught before we specialize in high school or whatever. You know, the only way you really get an opportunity to learn about the medieval period in depth is if you take a history course at uni and you do. 
medieval history, right? Mm. It's uh, And it's because it's complex and because there's a lot of things going on. And also it doesn't really feed into very well our kind of like imperialist and colonial education that we really privilege now, oh. right? It's like no one wants to talk about the time when white people weren't the most important, right? It's like we only want to talk about when white people were important. Uh, so it, it kind of like goes by the wayside. And that's how we get myths like this is that, you know, you're kind of just allowed to make stuff up yeah. based on vibes. Right. And um, so that's why it is important to kind of pay attention because the myths that get made up are really weird and self-serving. And so, you know, it's our job to kind of like have a look where we can and get out in front of those. Yeah, I absolutely. I am at going a medieval because I, I got in there first, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> the OG. Yeah, you know it. Yeah. And are there, are there other places people can find you on the internet? Yes. So I've got my blog, which is going-medieval.com. I write there all the time about random stuff. So if you like this, uh, check that out. And also, I have a comic book out now, uh, which is called The Middle Ages, A Graphic History. It's out on Icon. Um, it's got really pretty pictures and it is based on first year courses that I teach in medieval history. So idea is you'll kind of get a broad overview if you want to know more about, you know, the medieval period and what went on. That should set you up really well for having a good idea. Plus the pictures are pretty. Amazing. We love pretty pictures. I am so for comic. <laughs> yes. yes. We will put all the links to, to all of the things in the show notes. Um, are you ready for the lightning round? I have my questions. I'm ready. So... Yay! We asked the same questions to everyone we interview, and I wrote these just because I thought they were fun. The first question, what does feminism mean to you? Mm. This is a huge question, isn't it? I suppose that feminism to me is kind of like a call to reorganize our society in a way that is more equitable for everybody. So it is about acknowledging the ways in which women have historically and generally been disadvantaged mm -hmm. uh, by our society and attempting to then redress those things. I think that within that, it's really important for us to kind of like think about obviously intersectionality and the way that things work because like here I am a white lady. That's the easiest kind of lady that there is to be. And uh, I don't think that we're really helped by like you know white feminism or like girl boss feminism where it's all like oh well oh if there were more women prison guards everything would be fine like that's not mm -hmm. what i'm talking about we need to pull this stuff up by the root and we've got to do everything over again because the way that we have set the patriarchy up it's bad for men it's bad for women it's bad for our non-binary friends it's bad for everybody right so feminism is saying we've got to redress all these things and start over there's nothing about this that can be saved this is gar dump it dump it <laughs> <laughs> like, the ground and get rid of the hierarchical stuff yeah exactly like we got we got to start things out in in a way that is not hierarchical in which you know takes everybody's views into accounts and that's when we're gonna get to the real good stuff so you know my feminism is really based on starting over but building communities that kind of like put new ways of thinking about gender in mind so that we can like really we can it's possible you know, social constructs are constructs, but that means that they can be unmade, right? I love that so much. That is a brilliant answer to that question. Second question, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, wow. That's a huge one. They get easier, I promise. Uh, yeah, so the best piece of advice that I've ever received. This is from my best friend, Patty. So she said that, quote to me, Dog the Bounty Hunter changed my life. And I said, Patty, what the <laughs> hell does that mean? And she said... Once she was watching the reality television show Dog the Bounty Hunter. And he was talking about how he got into bounty hunting because he was in and out of prison a lot. He was just kind of always doing the wrong thing. And he said, well, one day he just decided he was going to start pretending like he was a good guy. Like, I'm just going to kind of like pretend that I'm not like doing illegal things. I'm just going to pretend I'm going to pretend that I'm a good guy. And like, eventually he did stop like committing crime all the time and he got himself into how it is. And Patty did this for herself where she used to be really cripplingly shy. And she said that she was going to like pretend that she just wasn't shy and she was just going to pretend to be really extroverted. And now she isn't shy anymore. And I have taken that and uh, bound it up in my head with asking yourself the very important question, what in these the situations would Kanye West do? And if Kanye West was told, no, that isn't good, you shouldn't do that. Would Kanye West not do it? No. Kanye West is going to go home and he's going to make fat beats, <laughs> right? And he's going to like get out there and he's just going to like put himself out in the world. So my advice with these two things, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it and give yourself room 
Uh, even when people say that there isn't, you know, room for you to be doing a particularized thing, just do it. Like, right. Just like, just fake it. Like pretend you're Kanye West, right? Pretend you're Kanye West right now and uh, hold yourself up, pull yourself up, put yourself out there and you might find that actually works out. I love that. That's amazing. Yes. So, so good. So good. Uh, okay. Next one. Who's a woman that you really admire and why? Oh man, there are so many. I am really into, I'll give you a medieval woman. And here's a kind of normal, she's not a normal medieval woman, but here's a woman I like. Her name was Joan of Leeds and she was a nun. And Joan of Leeds staged a breakout from her nunnery by putting a fake body in her bed and like running off with some guy uh, to go have a bunch of sex. (laughs) And there was a, like basically an APB gets put out for her and uh, like the, the bishop is like, she has left the nunnery to quote, pursue the way of carnal lust. <laughs> and um, I absolutely love that for Joan of Leeds. And I think about Joan of Leeds a lot. Uh, and I think it's really cool that like, you know, she, she had, you know, like being a nun, that's a fairly cushy life as lives go in the medieval period. But my girl knew what she actually needed, which was like a whole bunch of sex. And she did what she needed to do. And she got out there and she lived her best (laughs) life. And I think that is so cool in like a world that is so against um, how horny women are and how they're always trying to have sex and they're like please just be religious and Joan like almost did it was like on second thought nah I'm going for it and I love that for her I really hope that she got that D and it was great you know? <laughs> think about her all the time think about she Joan all the goals. time we love Joan <laughs> right what an amazing chick right just really just just did what she wanted to do for her like without any of the kind of um societal pressures or expectations good for her we could do a whole episode on her grace absolutely i love her she's great yeah Mm. Mm. love that answer amazing uh next question what's the best book you've read this year oh um i've read some really good books this year so um that is a big one i've got two favorites um i really love justin hancock's can we talk Mm -hmm. about consent which is really incredible. Um, and I really loved uh, Catherine Angel's Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again. Oh, okay. Amazing choices. Really made me think a lot about, you know, my own writing and work on uh, these subjects. Uh, both of them are really accessible and interesting and you plow through them in about two hours. But at the same time, they really make you change your life a little bit. And you can't say fairer than that. I am right? writing those titles down so I can go and read them immediately. Yeah, we'll like them. Yeah. You're going to like I'm them. I'm going to go and <laughs> order more books and ignore my giant to be read pile. That's what's always good and safe. Just <laughs> just keep just pile them up. Just, just pile them up. Don't the, look the too closely. The answer to buying more books is 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 always yes. Okay, ne- next next yeah. question. Mm-hmm. Imagine that we are doing this interview face to face in a coffee shop. What are you ordering from the coffee shop? Mm. Okay, uh, I am a black Americano type bitch most of okay. the time. But having said that, if I'm out in public and someone else is going to make me a coffee, I might get it frothy. <laughs> I quite like a cortado. So I might go there. And um, I'm going to have a look at the cake. I'm going to like get the vibe. Because I still, I'll tell you what, if there's a pastel de nata, I'm going to smash it. It's going to get, mm. that. that is going to be over. But then having said that, cafe across the road from me they uh do greek food and they make they do a very good line in a spanakopita and i can sort of like not resist a spanakopita so uh, it might be that so it's really i'm gonna look at that food no i'm like i'm like a, like i'm a coffee flavored coffee type bitch you know like i don't not there's nothing wrong with a sweet coffee but you know for the most part i've got to be in the mood for that if it's hot enough i'll go ice latte though mm, always a good choice i do like an ice latte i know the answer to this next one because i follow you on twitter but um the, the <laughs> listeners need to know about this one um do you have a pet i do her name is cabbage she is a manx cat she's a little brown tabby manx cat and you know shout out to her for bringing a mouse into my bedroom at 4 30 a.m yesterday oh, no. strong oh cats. strong good move dog. good cat we love mm-hmm. them. She's a good hunter. <laughs> the second part of that question is, can we see pictures? But anyone who wants to see pictures can follow you on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Follow me on Twitter. There is so many pictures of cabbage. Uh, that's mostly, I put a bonnet on her the other day. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> How did that go down? Her uncle Philip bought it for her. He saw, like, saw it online. And it was like one of those boxes that say cats love it with a cat clearly not loving life <laughs> wearing it. <laughs> Um, I saw immediately, obviously, like he, he immediately bought it and sent it to me. So I put the bonnet on her. She was so good. She did not love it to be clear, but like, she really like, she let me put it on her and just like 
I was holding her and she just like sat perfectly still and was like, these fucking guys are doing this again. All right. Yeah. And like, let us take all the pictures while remaining exactly perfectly still was like, okay, they're doing this. There's, this is time. I put her on the ground. She immediately kicked it off and ate a snack. <laughs> so she's living her best life. So at the end of our regular episodes, we do our basic bitch gratitude list. So in, in honor of that, the next question is, what is one thing that you're grateful for right now? I am grateful for right now having a little bit more time and space to think. I turned a draft of my book in the other week. And, you know, it's so amazing when, you know, the biggest piece of work you have to get done is taken off your plate. Um, and it makes me feel like I've got a little bit more time to think expansively, do some more reading. It's nice to have room in my head to think about what the next thing might be, I suppose. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a yes, that's a really good answer. Well, congratulations on the book. That's exciting. Thank you. I love having written books. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I write one, I'm like, why the hell did I do? Christ, no, it's awful. And then afterwards, I'm like, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. <laughs> do we get to know the title of the book or is it still a secret? Um, I think that you can, you know, it might get monkeyed around with later, but it is currently a talk called The Once and Future Sex, uh, How Medieval Women Made the Modern World. I am buying it immediately when it comes out. Sounds yeah. great. Okay, so the last question is, what is one piece of feminist media that you wish everyone would watch, read, listen to, or otherwise consume? Ooh, consume... I think that you are never going to go wrong with reading some Judith Butler, personally. Mm -hmm. What is it that I want to say that everybody should read of hers? I'm trying to, like, narrow it down. Gender Trouble, I suppose. Yeah. I really, very good choice. Yeah. We'll, 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 go, we'll go with that. Right, yeah. There, there are so many, but that is a very good choice. Amazing. I love all of those answers so much. That is fabulous. Well, Eleanor, thank you so much again for coming on our show and being so fabulous and interesting and teaching us all of the things. This, this was brilliant. <laughs> love women, start trouble. Yes! Order. Yes, yeah. that Amazing. is perfect. <laughs> thank you so much, Eleanor. And until next time, start trouble and love women. Thanks Bye. everyone for listening. Bye! Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. Start trouble. <laughs> you know, that's always bad listening to women. <laughs>